Welcome back, everybody, to the main stage here at API World. We have our next uh, and first keynote of the morning, Eric Newcomer, CTO at WSO2. He's going to be talking to you about improving customer experience using cloud native deployment. Eric, you want to join me here on the main stage? OK, that's, uh, that's great. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Uh, hello and welcome to my talk, everybody. Very pleased to be here. And thanks, Jonathan, again for the uh, great award yesterday that we got for APIM as the best API middleware among the, all other award winners from API uh, World, which is, uh, of course, a great conference and very uh, much appreciated uh, that we got this uh, award. What I'd like to talk about today is uh, a bit of, you know, something different than some of the usual topics around API development and design. And I'm going to start in on that point where you've got your app already. You've got that great digital app. You've got that great website, that great mobile app. And you want to be able to deploy with agility and scale and have that always on reliable feeling that customers get from the digital leaders that customers are used to. And this is what we, when we talk about customer experience, part of that, a big part of that is has to do with how things are deployed and managed and always up. When you think about uh, back in the early days of the web, for example, it was not uncommon to have websites crash under heavy loads. We don't see that anymore. Part of the reason is a widespread adoption of cloud native deployment techniques. And we also are seeing very agile progression of developing and deploying microservices at speed to improve the customer experience, to put that, that code out there, get a reaction from a customer, change it and put it back out to help solve the next problem for the customer and iteratively improve that customer experience as well. So what I want to do is talk a bit about that aspect today. Uh, before we get into that, I'll just introduce myself uh, briefly. My name is Eric Newcomer, CTO at WSO2. I joined just about a year ago now from Citibank. My last role at Citibank was a chief uh, security architect in the consumer bank. Before that, I was a chief architect for treasury and trade solutions. Before joining Citi, I was the chief architect in Credit Suisse for investment banking. And before that, CTO at Iona Technologies, which is a very similar role to what I have today. So it was a bit of a back to the future for me. I went into one of our big customers' environment that was Credit Suisse from Iona. I was in banking for about 10 years, banking and financial services, did a lot of architecture work, and now back into technology. Uh, among the things I did at Citi was help with our cloud migration strategy. I was, uh, took the lead for a treasury and trade solutions on our cloud migration, uh, redesign our systems from monolith to microservices, uh, brought in OpenShift, Docker, and, and other technologies, and worked uh, generally across the bank as well on committees for planning cloud migration. So one of the things I'm doing here at, uh, at uh, WSO2 is helping with the cloud pivot that we're making with our next generation of products, which uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit today in the context of what's behind that and what's going on uh, with that and why it's so important to start thinking about cloud native engineering, cloud native deployment, cloud native techniques. And uh, way back before that, I started my career in uh, database transaction processing and digital equipment. And along the way have worked on quite a few industry standards, particular uh, the web services standards, uh, OMG standards, uh, OSGI standards uh, and so on. And wrote a few books along the way that have been used as textbooks and uh, co-owner of a patent on, on mobile middleware as well. Uh, please uh, follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter. I'm trying to get back into that after about 10 years in financial services where we were not very active on those platforms, but I'm, but I'm uh, definitely getting back into that now and hope to connect with you there. Okay, so just a bit of a compare and contrast to set the scene. You know, way back when Commercial computing started, everything was on mainframes. Here's a Univac, was one of the first commercial uses of a computer. Uh, I think it was for the US Census, was one of the very first applications ever written and deployed onto a mainframe. And in those days, those applications were designed and engineered specifically for those machines, for their tape drives, for their memory, for their disk, for their particular operating system, hardware and software. Everything was very proprietary. And in those days, you also went into the room, as you see these people here in the computer room with the computer. And that's where you went to run your programs. And it was all batch. Nothing was interactive. You ran in with your batch program, got the results, and, and you left, basically. And now today, on the right-hand side, this is what a data center looks like for the cloud. You can't even go in there if you want to. These are all secured. The sites are secured. 
Uh, never mind getting into the, the data center. You can't even get onto the site uh, without going through strict security clearance. So now we're going from a place, uh, a time in which computers were in a room, in a uh, computer room, and there could have been many computers in the computer room in the enterprise uh, over time, but they were still in a room. It was still a place you went. You didn't have a computer with you all the time. Computers weren't everywhere. Uh, and now you've got a, a, a cloud native a data center with hundreds and thousands of PC grade, of consumer grade servers stitched together to give you that same or better in many cases capability than the old mainframes could could provide uh, and you don't have any idea anymore where your program is running and, and you really shouldn't uh, even care about it as long as everything is running well and giving you that great experience and when we're talking about cloud native data centers and the improvements and the benefits you get from moving into the cloud we're talking about agility we're talking about scale talking about reliability and we're talking about uh, cost efficiency, although depending on how many of the cloud services you use, that may or may not, your mileage may vary. But generally speaking, it's a, it's, it's a cheaper model for you uh, when someone else is hosting all this, this equipment. But what this means also is to deal with this, you're not going in as a person to load and run programs. You're using automation to do it. The only way to handle the mapping of those great digital apps into these cloud native data centers is to automate that process. It can't be done by, by humans. So as we were saying, this is a major change in computing. At one time you went to a computer room where the computers lived and you engineered applications to run on that computer and people went in there and operated those computers and managed them and loaded programs and ran them and got the results uh, or even you know logged into them and got the results after a while. Now we have cloud native programs that run, could be anywhere in the world. We, we sort of know if we wanted to where the data centers are and the availability zones are within those cloud data centers. But in some cases we may not know very precisely where things are running, but that's okay. Uh, you get a lot of benefits from moving to this model, but to get those benefits, you have to understand how things work. You have to engineer your systems, uh, your applications for those cloud native data centers to get the best out of them. If you just take the old, you know, for a simple compare and contrast, if you just take the old mainframe apps and run them in the cloud, they will run, but you will not get auto scale. You will not get auto resiliency. You will not get a lot of the cost benefits and the uh, benefits of customer experience that you need to get. You need to reinvest and change and re-engineer the applications. And when we're talking about APIs, of course, if you're creating new APIs, you can engineer them for that environment from the beginning, which is what, where you'll get the best results. But of course, a lot of workloads are still on-prem and we have to figure out how to work with those, maybe put APIs on them that we access from our cloud native APIs or move some of those workloads over as microservices and put APIs around them. The point is we have to adapt, not only how we're thinking about computing from as a place you go to a place that something is automated and runs anywhere, to uh, the way in which you, you develop and deploy your APIs as well to get all the best benefits out of it. And when we're talking about this, uh, how it's all kind of evolved over the last 20 years or so since cloud native computing was, was invented, uh, we have really the, 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 the big trend, uh, and a very important trend of breaking up applications into features and functions that are implemented as microservices with bounded context and strict interface control so they can be updated individually. It's one of the great benefits of microservices and, and cloud native computing is when you break up your functions into microservices with bounded context, you have a change in a microservice, a change in a function, you need to fix a bug, to fix an error. You can just replace that microservice by itself without replacing the whole application. Uh, and then this kind of led to the standardization of Docker containers which evolved during the, the, uh, the last 20 years to be the way in which you put your microservice programs, your API programs into a container so they can be deployed on any system. Uh, so it's independent of hardware. And then finally, once you've got your containers for how you can deploy, then you have the automation provided by Kubernetes, which orchestrates those containers across many computers. So now you can break up your API code into microservices. Uh, you can put those, that code and those APIs into containers, which will run on any computer. And you can hand off as a developer, 
with a Kubernetes config file to the Kubernetes system so that it figures out where in that vast array of, pre, of, of consumer grade servers you're going to run, actually deploy that microservice and maybe many copies of that microservice if you need to scale or if you need to have resiliency uh, and so on. So this is the um, kind of the industry analogy for this automation, right? This comes from the shipping containers which can be loaded on ships, can go on trains, can go on trucks. This, of course, revolutionized shipping. And even though we have some bottlenecks in our shipping systems today, it's still much improved, vastly improved over what it used to be 50, 100 years ago before containers were invented. And you had the standards of how to pack and load uh, ships and trains and trucks to get goods from one place to another. So for, for the cloud native uh, computing, Put your code in a container, give it to the Kubernetes operating system. It'll figure out where to run them in that vast array of computers that are now in, involved in cloud native data centers. Uh, just as a kind of interesting side note, computer companies and you know Sun is not really around anymore. It's in, on its own since it was bought by Oracle, but of course IBM is still around and they do sell data centers in shipping containers, which is kind of a, just an interesting side note. You can have containers deployed in containers. Just some item of interest there. Okay, so back to the topic of, of the automation. So Kubernetes is the standard now for how you do container, or, container orchestration for cloud native computing and how and where are you gonna run all those containerized programs uh, that hold your microservices and your APIs. So this is very simple view of what it looks like. There's a control plane uh, within Kubernetes, which has a UI, a command line interface into it, it has the API, of course, Kubernetes has APIs like, like everything else. And it has a scheduler, a controller, a manager, and an XCD for command lines and executing commands. And it takes those containers and figures out based on the configuration file that you give to Kubernetes, you input to Kubernetes, where to deploy the containers, how many containers to deploy, Kubernetes deploys them in pods, and then how, what kind of a load balancing you might have over them. And then maybe for uh, Kubernetes, you might have some auto, uh, some, uh, auto scale based on resources. That's different from auto scale of microservices where you replicate the microservice here. Kubernetes can help extend the resources, the CPU, the memory, the disk uh, for those Kubernetes clusters if it runs out of capacity, it can do that for you. And you have the container runtime, kubelets and networking and it's all pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, when you have these things, uh, you remember that picture of the data center with the hundreds of thousands of computers. Uh, Kubernetes was developed uh, by Google originally as a project called Borg, which is a way in which to provision these Kubernetes clusters across those huge data centers and have those things ready for when the developers hand off the microservices with the APIs into those containers and the system just automatically provisions them and sends them out for execution across those those uh, Kubernetes clusters. Very easy, simple, no problem, right? Well, that's uh, nice, but to get this thing set up and to have it run correctly, to have Kubernetes clusters work correctly all the time can be difficult. So here's a chart that shows the uh, troubleshooting flow if something goes wrong in a Kubernetes cluster. And this is a, from the Kubernetes website itself, and it can be pretty complex. So there's a lot of discussion in the industry about you know, Kubernetes being the next app server. I don't really look at it uh, like an app server. It's uh, something more like a pegboard in which, to which you slot standard containers. Um, and it needs to be set up, and it, but it needs to be managed. And often the, the big guys, uh, Google and Uber and um, Amazon, uh, Facebook, these guys will have dedicated site reliability engineering teams to set up and manage the cluster so that they're ready for that handoff from the developers. But let's say you're not one of these big guys. Uh, you don't have a dedicated SRE team to set up and manage your Kubernetes clusters. And you are sort of thinking a bit of it a bit more like an app server that something developers get involved in and work with. It can be a pretty complex part of their job and something that can cause some pain if it's not set up correctly or if a problem occurs. So what do we do about this? Well, now that we know Kubernetes is going to be everywhere, we can start building platforms on top of Kubernetes. So we can start saying, okay, we know Kubernetes is always going to be there and we know that because 
all of the public cloud providers provide uh, Kubernetes uh, clusters for you. AWS, Google, Azure, Oracle, IBM. Uh, there are many uh, vendors uh, as well, suppliers of Kubernetes for on-prem deployments for private clouds, such as OpenShift from, from Red Hat, Linode, uh, Rancher, VMware, uh, Nomad, and, and so on. So once you can figure that this standard uh, cluster uh, arrangement is going to be there, no matter where you're going to deploy, and what cloud provider or even on-prem, you can say, all right, now let's build up from there to have another level. And this is something you could call a platformer level that abstracts the Kubernetes uh, runtime and provides at uh, an abstract level things like multi-cloud or multi-cluster environment management, secrets and config management, things that you would have to do individually for your Kubernetes clusters that, that, that create some of this complexity it's hard to deal with. The identity and access management systems, the CICD pipelines for deployments, how does it attach to storage? How do you do monitoring, logging? How do you get the API access? How do you do the Helm catalogs and so on? And all of these things now, uh, you know, the main point is Kubernetes is always going to be there. The industry's reached a, 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 a level of maturity with respect to containers and container orchestration standards so that we know Kubernetes is going to be there. Kubernetes has been called a platform, but now we can also talk about building platforms on that platform if you want to think about it that way. So here at uh, WSO2, one of the things we're doing is creating a Kubernetes platform for APIs. So this is part of our move to the cloud and our new product uh, is called Corio. It's in beta right now. And what we're doing with this, and we're, we're building this out, this is the Corio vision. We have a solution architecture's input, which is represented on the upper left-hand side here. This is how do you decompose your, your app into microservices? How do you do your domain-driven design? How do you create your API-first design for your solution, for your digital transformation project? You input that into the uh, platform, the API platform, and you have within the platform the capability of developing new APIs, integrating APIs, developing new services, microservices with APIs. And we can create uh, different levels of abstraction in the dev environment. We can provide no code templates for citizen developers, low code diagrams for ad hoc developers and full code for pro developers all within the same box. And we know that all of this code that's generated from these different abstractions is going to go into GitHub and go through a build, test and deploy pipeline uh, automatically and publish out those APIs and consume APIs from an API marketplace, which represent ability, the way in which we get existing services and SaaS APIs into the ecosystem. The platform also will include, uh, includes, not will include, but does include analytics, uh, observability to see if the code is running correctly or not, AI to help uh, sort of like um, autocomplete on steroids to help you to code things correctly in the first place and security for zero trust deployments, which are very important uh, in the cloud. So all of this running uh, in the cloud as a kind of software as a service model, abstracting the dev part, and perhaps more importantly, the ops part, uh, which is what the kind of focuses of the, the talk today. So you get another look at this uh, from kind of a more descriptive uh, point of view, what it is, what is it that's in this, in this platform it is built on top of uh, Kubernetes for APIs. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, Cori is one example of this, but I think we're going to see this become quite a trend in the industry now that Kubernetes is the standard we can all build on. We have the uh, development abstractions for integrations and microservices. We can include service mesh for those microservices. The inputs, as I mentioned, solution architecture, domain-driven design, uh, and the uh, pipeline for the code that's, that's created, goes into GitHub, processed through the DevOps pipeline, use the GitOps configuration management system for Kubernetes and is deployed out to Kubernetes. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the uh, APIs are generated and consumed from the marketplace so we can include existing IT environments, whether on-prem or in the cloud, SaaS APIs from other cloud providers and include them into the integrations the new microservices, the new APIs that are being developed and deployed. So what we're really talking about here is we've got a, a, a level of maturity in the industry where we know how cloud native apps 
are built, how cloud native APIs are built, how cloud native integrations are built, how microservices are built with uh, and exposing new APIs to help power those digital transformation applications. We know uh, that we can create great GUIs for mobile apps. The standards are out there. Customers expect them. They expect a great experience with their uh, digital app. This is how we judge businesses anymore is the, the strength of their digital app, whether the web page or most likely on the mobile phone. And co consumers that are used to having those great digital experiences from Uber and Netflix and uh, Airbnb, uh, Amazon website, uh, Amazon mobile app, any of those apps, uh, some of the leading fintech apps, uh, businesses, these businesses are disruptive because they're providing the great digital experience uh, that traditional vendors, traditional businesses were, were not uh, providing because they were not really focused on the online as much. And now this has become the way business is done. It's how people differentiate themselves. It's what customers expect when they interact with your website and your mobile app. And that means you need to have behind the, those great GUIs those great GUIs aren't going to deliver the functionality on their own. They need to have the APIs, the microservices, the integrations behind them that connect those APIs and, uh, and GUIs, connect them to APIs that, that connect to the back end for data sources that power those APIs and transactions that update from those APIs into those, into those apps, all make it very seamless and easy to use. And in the cloud now, we also understand that the benefits of these models include not just the scale, resiliency, and the reliability, and that always-on feeling of the customer experience that people people want, but also by breaking up the, the functions into microservices and automating the deployment, the rapid uh, iteration and improvement of those user experiences. So you can get something out there very quickly, test it with customers, get the feedback, figure out what other problems they need you to solve and iterate very quickly through this de this deployment abstraction that now we have by building a platform on top of Kubernetes. So we're talking here about building those great backends. You might some people call it backend as a service to power those great front ends. And to do that, we leverage the standardization of containers and container orchestration and automation of deployment to make sure that the iterative agile capabilities of cloud native engineering can be uh, realized and the benefits can be achieved for those for those APIs and for those apps. So let's talk a bit more in summary about this evolution of API platforms and the maturity of Kubernetes because you know, I've kind of gone through this and said, you know, we, we've noticed that we can observe that everybody's implementing Kubernetes. Kubernetes is being provided on, uh, sorry, Hit the, hit the wrong button there. It's the Kubernetes being provided by all cloud providers, a lot of on-prem Kubernetes for, for private clouds. Um, but is this going to last? Is this something that's going to be there? Can we really bet on this? Can we really think we're going to be able to invest on this for in, in, in for the long term? Because you know the evolution of, of computing clearly points to this uh, as a lasting platform. Uh, if you just trace the evolution of it, it goes through microservices coming out, uh, you know, I guess probably in the mid 2000s. I think they originated the combination of, of Amazon and uh, Netflix and becoming the way in which you moved existing enterprise apps into, into the cloud. And then, of course, they just needed a, way, a better way of deployment uh, than, app, than the old, uh, you know, Tomcat containers. You needed a standardized container and Docker was uh, developed and there were multiple container uh, standards being proposed and Docker really won out. And then later on, there were uh, other proposals for kind of orchestration of containers. And you would have had a, a, a number of uh, platforms being proposed as the standard for cloud native deployment, such as Heroku, Cloud Foundry, OpenStack, Mesos, Swarm to some extent. But those also uh, did not become the standard. Kubernetes has become the standard. So it's become well well established. And you could say, okay, until something else comes along. But I remember when I was working on web services uh, 20 years ago, we would get the same question. Okay, what's that's the latest thing, but something else is gonna come along. Why should I invest in this particular technology, knowing that technology always changes and there'll be a new trend, a new buzzword coming along. But that uh, was 20 years ago and we still have WSDL and SOAP out there, systems built with those things, they're still running. 
systems that we build with Kubernetes today are going to be running for the long time for foreseeable future. Yes, something else will come along someday, but if you just look at where we've come from to where we are with the Kubernetes uh, evolution, I think it's pretty clear that the standardization of something like this is not done lightly uh, and it takes a, some time, but once it's done, it, it you know something like a web services standard took a while to, to develop and put in place. Something like Kubernetes took a while to emerge from microservices, Docker, uh, standardization of how this is all working. And now that it's here, it's going to be here for the foreseeable future because it has evolved through that process and become the standard uh, where there are many other contenders for it. Um, and sure, there are complexities and issues with Kubernetes, but these can be abstracted. Now that we know the Kubernetes Foundation is going to be there uh, and that some flavor of Kubernetes is going to be there, we can start working at the next level and abstracting those complexities of Kubernetes, such as such as we're doing with uh, with with Corio, and uh, many others are, are also starting to do now that it's clear Kubernetes is going to be the standard. <clears throat> and particularly for us, when we're thinking about in the API world, thinking about APIs that we develop and deploy, we can develop and deploy these into the Kubernetes ecosystem with confidence that that ecosystem is going to be there for the foreseeable future, and we will get that value out of those investments. As I mentioned earlier, the benefits of cloud native computing are not for free. Programs work very differently in the cloud than they did on the mainframe world. And these are often contrasted as scale up versus scale out. And just like scale up, programs were engineered for that type of environment, for the mainframe environment to take best advantage of its resources, the disks, the memory, the tape, the CPU. Programs are engineered to get the best out of cloud native data centers where networking is now uh, one of the top resources that you can rely on uh, and, or, and or assume that you'll have uh, the ability to rely on that as well as just as well as you rely on CPU, disk, memory resources and to design your applications for that highly distributed environment, which provides that kind of resiliency, the scale and the agility and uh, the reliability that you need to provide those great digital experiences for those those digital apps. And you can, I think we can all assume this is gonna be here for a while and, and we're going to be able to make those investments with confidence to get those benefits. And those benefits will accrue for, for many years once we do make those investments. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, an example and I want to be clear this uh, Capital One is not a customer of WSO2. So we had no part of this journey, but it's a well-documented case study, and I think fairly famous case study in its in its way. It's certainly at least in the financial services industry where I've been working for the last 10 years or so. This is uh, one of the main examples where a traditional bank that was started, you know, before the cloud, who, who had traditional data centers with the mainframe scale-up model that were running their business, made the transition completely into the cloud. They announced this past year uh, that they have moved all their data centers into AWS and are not running any on-prem applications uh, anymore in their own data centers. This is big news uh, in the financial services world, at least. Uh, and we do know there are other famous examples uh, such of this. Perhaps Netflix is the, the biggest initial example where a monolithic application running on a Java EE app server was tr transformed and re-engineered into microservices uh, for, for the cloud. Capital One has now done that uh, in, in the banking and financial services area. Uh, it took them four years to do it. They, uh, the information that's here is a summary of their case studies that are published on the Amazon website. You can look all of this up. It's all public information. And it reinforces uh, a lot of the, the benefits that we talk about in terms of what you want to achieve when you invest in moving to the cloud. So we, I think we talked, uh, touched a little bit earlier about the com competitive edge of uh, being able to provide a great customer experience. And this is something Capital One has achieved by moving to the cloud native world, into the cloud, into the cloud, into AWS, uh, the public cloud in particular. And they serve customers at the speed they demand. So now that they're in the cloud, they're able to improve the customer experience at speed. It's one of the things why uh, you want to invest in getting your APIs into the cloud and to get that agility, to be able to iterate and improve the customer experience to keep up 
with those great customer experiences that all customers expect from the digital leaders. Now, if you deliver it as a bank, that's how people, customers are going to judge you. Do you have a great mobile app? Is it better mobile app than your competitors? And being able to iterate that mobile app quickly and respond to customer feedback quickly will give you the competitive edge there. And that's what they're talking about. Uh, going along with that very much a part and parcel of that's the agility and speed to market that they can get new features out multiple times a day. I remember uh, talking with a, a former uh, colleague of mine who went to work for a company called Guilt Group that was in the fashion resale, hot sale industry. Uh, were very great and very nice website. They were acquired by Hudson Retail, the owners of Hudson Stores, uh, Lord & Taylor in, in the, here in New York, uh, as well as Saks Fifth Avenue. And the idea was to use that great website for the Lord & Taylor, the Hudson Retail business, the Saks Fifth Avenue business, each of whom had their own websites. They were not easy to use. They were losing customers because customers were used to having a great digital experience, shopping experience. And Guilt Group had this for their fashion uh, resale. And Hudson Group had aspired to this. And if you look at another example, perhaps of Macy's, they were able to make the transition. The Macy's website gives you a good shopping experience. Uh, at that time, Lord & Taylor uh, did not. And I saw him once for, for breakfast. I said, you know, how's the new job going? What's going on? He said, well, I, I'm a culture warrior. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, well, here at, you know, at Guild Group, we use microservices. We use cloud native engineering capabilities. We have a, a, a bug or an error in one of our programs. We fix it and we deploy it. If it passes all the tests in the CI CD pipeline, we deploy it that day. Uh, Hudson Group is on the old model. If they find a bug, they have a monolith. Uh, they have to test, build, deploy. It takes them a couple of weeks to put that fix into production. So this is what agility speed to market means. It means releasing changes. Uh, I, I have talked with people who work on the Amazon website. They push hundreds, if not thousands, of changes out every day uh, to their website. And this, of course, not everyone is going to be Amazon. But the point is, Capital One is saying they've gotten this benefit by moving to the cloud by adopting cloud native deployment capabilities and, be, and becoming more agile and getting the that type of time to market by releasing those changes very quickly because of adopting microservice, because of re-engineering for cloud native deployment. Uh, so good good example to reinforce the, the points and the benefits that, that are uh, available by going this route. They also are now calling themselves a technology company that offers financial services as digital products. This is something very in interesting coming out of the financial services industry. There was a lot of discussion in the banks about, are we a technology company? Are we a bank? What's our focus? And many banks are, were trying to think of themselves more as a technology company because uh, more and more of the banking services were being done digitally. Certainly uh, during the pandemic, I was working at Citi for the beginning of it. We had no branches. We had tremendous pressure to digitize all the products that still required somebody to go into a branch to, to take advantage of and get those, get those on, online. Uh, were we a technology company because of that? This is a very interesting debating point in the industry. Capital One is coming out there and saying, yes, we are a technology company. Uber, I think, is another example. Are you a transformation, transportation company? No, we're a technology company that provides transportation services. How do you think of yourself? What are you? It's a very interesting kind of a question. And when you go to the cloud, technology does become uh, more important and perhaps more eminent, uh, more critical part than your, your other business because of how you deliver the business is through technology as opposed to the business being something that's uh, delivered independent of it. Inter anyway, interesting kind of a side note. <clears throat> but when we hear this about companies thinking of themselves as technology companies, it means now they've really gone through this transformation and usually to cloud native computing. So again, innovation more quickly because of uh, AWS features and technologies, all the cloud native services available on AWS. Uh, many of these technologies are also available on-prem for private clouds. Uh, the developers are, are very productive. <clears throat> but last but not least, they had to invest. They needed a strong governance function Microservices, uh, I'm sure all of us at API World are very familiar with API governance because that's part of API management. But it takes on a special meaning in microservices 
when the APIs are something that have bounded context and cannot be changed without impacting another, are not to be changed when they impact another microservice because that inhibits the ability to deploy independently. In other words, to put it the other way, the ability to deploy microservices independently with those APIs on them uh, depends on strong governance on those APIs. So if the APIs are not changed in a way in which would break uh, another API using that API. Uh, when you look at the Amazon website, microservices are behind the click to pay function, behind the review function, and those teams that support those microservices, those two pizza teams as they call them, small teams, are able to deploy updates to those functions independently of anything else on the page whenever they want to because their interfaces are strongly governed and they're not changing those interfaces when they do those deployments. And that allows all the other components of the page, all the other features of the application to similarly be independently deployed. So governance becomes very critical to agility and to success with microservices based uh, APIs, even more so than it had been for, for APIs really not associated with microservices. Not, not APIs in the context of agile microservices have greater governance requirements, I guess a good way to put it. They had to invest in that. And of course, security from going to the cloud this was another big thing we were really uh, focused on at City was actually the reason I went from chief architect in treasury and trade solutions to the uh, head of security architecture and strategy in the consumer bank. I was working on cloud security for our AWS pilot for payment processing, did all the security work myself and therefore sort of worked with a lot of these security folks and they encouraged me to, to move, move over and do more of that kind of work um, because security, especially in banking uh, for the cloud is so important and uh, we do know in fact, that Capital One had a, a pretty well-known breach uh, a year and a half ago or so, and you have to be, you know, it makes everyone in banking much more nervous about security. So that's another area of, you know, strong investment of focus <clears throat> and training for cloud literacy. What does this mean? Well, it means a lot of what I've been talking about is that programs are designed and deployed differently in the cloud to achieve the benefits of cloud native computing environments, cloud native infrastructure, all these things we're talking about, agility, resiliency, always on that great customer experience. You don't have these websites crashing anymore. We used to have this, remember, when you have a Rolling Stones tickets going on sale, Ticketmaster would crash from the load. You don't have this anymore because of cloud native infrastructure. But to get those benefits, to achieve that sort of scalability, that sort of handling those spikes automatically, you have to be able to engineer for it. You have to understand it. You have to understand cloud native programming, cloud native environment, cloud native infrastructure, all these things we've been talking about today that takes some investment. So overall, it took them four years to accomplish this. It's a great accomplishment, but if they only had a platform based on Kubernetes, if Kubernetes had only been the orchestration standard for containers when they started this journey, it could have been much shorter this is what we're where our goal is at WSO2. This is what we're working on, is to get you these benefits uh, much more quickly by abstracting the development process for new APIs, new microservices, new integrations, together with the deployment onto Kubernetes uh, at the click of a button, and take all these complexities and challenges that normally would take considerable investment to achieve out of the equation. So the results of those great APIs, those great backends to power those great customer experiences can be done more quickly, more productively. And you don't have to spend time building up this platform, building up the capabilities for site reliable en reliability engineering to deal with Kubernetes. You can just develop and click the button and, and go. So just to, to summarize, and then we'll probably uh, have a few minutes for questions. Um, basically, I made the case that Kubernetes platform is here to stay as a container orchestration standard, and we can build on it as a platform. And we'll go to the next level up uh, in making a platform for APIs, integrations, and services to be deployed in, in the cloud. So this is a great simplification that we're able to achieve by the fact that Kubernetes has become a standard. We can make the assumption it's there, build platforms on top of it, improve productivity, improve development, and improve deployment times. Uh, from WSO2, this is one example. I'm sure there are you know, many others out in the industry where people are working on this. 
and developing the next level up from the Kubernetes platform for different capabilities. Ours is called uh, Corio, and we fulfill this role by delivering the benefits of cloud native computing with low code, no code, full code abstractions, automatically build and deploy uh, APIs, integrations, and services to Kubernetes. It allows you to spend, allows anyone to spend more time on the innovations, on making sure that those customer feedback loops are captured, that those customer problems are solved, that the new versions are put out there quickly and iteratively to solve the problems at scale and maintain maintain your competitive edge, uh, which is now, as we've been saying, we see in the industry based more and more on that great experience, customer experience that uh, you provide in those digital applications. So more time on that, less time on plumbing. And then on top of that, we're adding in, as I think uh, is also one of the, the trends we're seeing in the industry, more for uh, AI and machine learning to help you uh, do the coding, help you figure out what's going to be the most efficient way to do things, uh, best data mappings, best adapters, best connectors, uh, best latency uh, and performance uh, designs and so on along with coding tips, runtime diagnostics. Uh, in addition to that, we are, uh, as many of you may know, at WSO2, we have another uh, product line other than API product line. We have identity access management product line. Uh, this has also been, been successful for us. And we're moving that into the cloud as well and integrating these two so that, you know, this is certainly one of those last but not at all least uh, items of importance that we have secure APIs uh, in when we deploy them. We have authentication mechanisms for them and the authorization behind those authentication mechanisms allow those IDs to be used uh, as a, a line of defense for cloud security and make sure that unauthorized access to data is not is not happening because those IDs, not only authentication is strong and, and robust and, and easy and flexible to use as well. All this has to be done for the great customer experience, but, but also that the authorization uh, is, is, is strong for uh, preventing un unwanted access to, to shared data or services. Uh, and so we're delivering this in the cloud, but we still are continuing to believe in the, the hybrid model uh, where companies will be running significant applications uh, on-prem uh, using the existing model in which so much has been invested and so much is working so well. And as we move to the new model and develop new capabilities, develop new digitization applications, we need to rely on those existing assets as well. Uh, so for the foreseeable future, we see the parallel progression of new code going to the cloud for, for especially to provide support to the digitization applications and the great customer experience, but also still relying on the investments of the existing assets that already exist to provide a lot of these functionalities. Certainly we were, we were doing that uh, at Citi and many other customers are doing that. And we think this is going to continue as a, as, as a, as a, for the foreseeable future. It's not going to be a cloud only. It's not going to be on-prem only. It's going to be both. Uh, and well, we hope you would get through this use uh, of Kubernetes as a platform from uh, us and whoever else is working on this, the next level of the industry progression for API development deployment is to get the cloud native benefits Capital One got but not using it, not, not taking four years, but uh, achieving it in, in months. And I think this is just a proof point of the power of the standards that have uh, evolved over the last few years through containers and container orchestration that allows us to do this and build up the next level. Okay, so that I will say thanks. And I will say thanks also to API World for the award uh, for best API middleware in the 2021 awards for WSO2 API manager. Thanks again for that. It means a lot. It's a great conference and a great award for us. Uh, for middleware means, you know, we're providing the whole solution, not just the API, but also the integrations, which, which we do.